Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio. Uh, we have got a old guest of the show. You will all know him. You all know of him, what he does, what his expertise is. He's a lovable character. He's a big name in fitness. He does really cool stuff. He's always willing to put himself out there. You know, give thought, be questioned. Um, we all love what he does. Uh, Dr. Lane Norton, welcome back on the show. Thanks, Ben. You're being very kind. I, I don't know how to say everybody loves what I do, but, you know, that's very nice of you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps by saying that, the people that don't will start to think, hmm, perhaps I should love Lane. Ben does. Yeah, maybe they should. Yeah, maybe. Yes, maybe you should. <laughs> yes, you should. Um, dude, um, it's it's been a while. Uh, I remember when we first talked, we kind of covered, like, nutrition. Then we looked at training. Um, then you had me on your podcast, which was awesome. Um, and I've kind of uh, dipped back into listening and observing a bit more of your work um, because, A, you've been teaching on our education course, so I've kind of gone, oh, I want to go and listen to what Lane's been teaching the students. And and secondly, um, you've done a couple of really good interviews on other people's platforms, and it kind of spurred my thought around what you're doing, and I thought, look, we've got to get Lane back on. I want to be able to share what's going on in his life. Um but firstly, probably one of the biggest things that's happened in your personal life or, or kind of the personal aspect of your life that you do share um, is that you had an injury recently and it's kind of been a bit of a ball ache. Um, what happened and kind of talk us through a bit of the rehab and the mental side of it that you went through because everyone goes through injuries, everyone finds it tough um, and we all want to be able to almost just manage it a bit better. Yeah, yeah. Um... Ball ache, I like that. I think I'll use that in the future. Um, so, yeah, um, basically, um, I had competed. So, uh, f rewinding, I won the USA National Championships for my weight class in powerlifting in 2014, then did the World Championships, won a silver medal there, and then won again in 2015, won the, the National Championships again, which qualified me for Worlds. In the IPF, the only way to get an automatic qualification, at least in the United States, is to win your weight class, which is very competitive. I think my I think my weight class last year had like 150 people in it. So it's not – and that's even with – you have to qualify just to go there. So it's very, very difficult. Um, and so I was, of course, going to do the World Championships, which were actually going to be in Texas. We're going to be in the United States, which it only happens there every few, every few years. So – I was very excited about that and was prepping for that meet as well as the Arnold in March. And this was in early January. I was on vacation with my family and uh, we were in, in the Florida Keys and I was working out at some gym that had some kind of crappy barbells and uh, a really whippy bar. I don't know if this is what caused it, but I was squatting and I have always had some hip shift when I squat. I tend to shift to the left. And uh, I shifted more than usual, and I felt like a, just like a, I don't want to say a pop, but I could tell something was wrong uh, in my left hip. And I, I kind of, I finished my workout, but I was in quite a bit of pain. And the next day, I was in a lot of pain in my, my left hip. And um, I gave it a week off, tried to go back in and squat, and worked up to 500-something pounds, and it was in quite a bit of pain, and every time I would try to work through it, it would get worse and worse. So finally I said, okay, well, I'm going to go get an MRI done. So I got an MRI done. MRI was clear. It didn't show anything. Come to find out if you have a hip problem, you probably should get an MRI with contrast and not just a regular MRI. So I got an MRI. didn't show anything. Went to an orthopedic, and he said, well, you have bursitis, uh, which is um, there's a bursa sac that sits right on top of your hip capsule, and uh, it's what the IT band slides over. So when you're when you're squatting, it's going to slide from one side to the other across this capsule. And so that kind of basically lubricates that band. Well, when that is inflamed, it's going to really rub that tendon and cause a lot of pain. Um, so he said, you know, the the downside is this is this tends to be a, kind of a, a semi chronic issue. The upside is that we can manage it with anti inflammatories and uh, a cortisone shot. He said, if you want to compete in the Arnold. Uh, which was four weeks away, he said, a cortisone shot's probably your best bet. I said, okay, well, let's do it. So we did a cortisone shot. That didn't do anything. Um, I came back. The solution was to take another cortisone shot, which I did, and that didn't do anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just nothing I did seemed to make a difference. Um, you know, high-dose anti-inflammatories. I even 
I had a pharmaceutical rep for another uh, first pharmaceutical company reach out to me and say, hey, we've got this uh, drug that's new that might help you. Tried that. It was very nice of him, but tried that. Didn't do anything. Didn't even touch it. In fact, it got to the point where it was so uh, painful when I was doing my Australia tour. Uh, I had taken three weeks off, completely off squatting. I was using high-dose anti-inflammatories the entire time. Had had the second cortisone shot and was really staying off of it. Went to go do one rep with 135 pounds, and it was like an 8 or 9 out of 10 on the pain scale. Wow. And I was just like – and that was about 12 weeks out from Worlds, and I was just like, listen, I'm – and at the same time, uh, I discovered I had two bulging discs in my neck that caused me to lose 100 pounds off my bench press in about three weeks. Uh, I just had no – it was the nerve that goes to the tricep, and I had no pressing power. So I'm like, all right. I can't squat. I can't bench. Um, I'm not one for quitting, but I think that I need to start being a little bit more realistic about Because even if I could start training hard that day, it was going to be really hard to make worlds mm -hmm. and be competitive. And with it just, you know, being completely, um, you know, not able to do anything without enormous amounts of pain, um, I just decided to pull the plug on it. I went, and so I... I said, okay, well, let's start from scratch. I'm not going to put a meat on the books. I'm not even going to think about when I'm going to compete next. I'm just going to get healthy. And however, if that takes me two years, it takes me two years. So, and I've done some reading at this point, and turns out bursitis is kind of a garbage can term. Um, people just tend to use that when there's hip pain that they can't figure out what it is. So, and my symptoms didn't really fit with it because bursitis should be like a, a dull ache. Um, it can get really bad, but it usually starts out as a dull ache and, and comes on pretty slowly. Kind of like tendonitis anywhere. You know, if you've had tendonitis, it's just like usually you start out and you have a little bit of discomfort and then it progresses to where it's a little painful and then it progresses to where it's really painful. This was instantaneous. Like I was just squatting and boom, all of a sudden it was hurting. Um, so that's why I think I probably tore a small muscle or ligament or something in my hip capsule and just the MRI didn't show it. So I started doing uh, physical therapy with a gal named Jamie Alumbra at, uh, here in town in Tampa, and she has made such a difference on me. So first thing she said, well, she's like, I want to get you moving better because if we get you moving better, if we get you squatting vertically and not shifting, if we get you moving better, eventually that pain is going to go away. And uh, sure enough, like when I came to her, I, like I said, I couldn't even squat. Like I could hardly squat an empty bar without pain. And uh, within... Within two weeks, within two sessions, I was able to squat 135 relatively pain-free um, and have been going up since then. And this past week, let's see, I'm, I'm going to hit 200 kilos this week. Actually, I'm going to hit 440 pounds for sets of five uh, tomorrow. So, like, and it's still, like, when I work out, when I train it, like, by the end, it will be in a little bit of discomfort. But for the most part, it's almost pain-free. And for where I was four or five months ago, that's incredible. So, like, what I would tell people is, you know, before you go in and you – like, what I've learned from this, before you go in and you get surgery or you you um, you do, uh, you know, some kind of drug treatment, like, go get PT. Go get – I don't know if you guys call it PT or physio. Yeah. Um, but uh, go get somebody who's really good who works with athletes and see if they – you just can't fix it that way because – you wouldn't think so. – if you showed me the exercise she had me doing, I would say, that's not going to make a damn difference. But it made a huge difference, you know. So um, I can't stress the importance of that enough. And now I go to her like every other week, not because I need to, but because I look at it as preventative medicine. You know, now I want to make sure that nothing's coming up that is going to cause me to go back into – or, you know, something new to develop. So I, I go every week or every other week and, and – um, and just try to be preventive, preventative that way. And she's been great. Um, yeah, I just I cannot speak highly enough of her. And also uh, Quinn Hinnock, who was the um, he was the he's the juggernaut training systems um, uh, PT. And he was the one he was the one who actually started me down the right path. I did an online consult with him, and he said, you know, because a lot of people were focusing on my left hip because that's where the pain was, and they were saying um, they were saying that. Um, you know, stretch that hip, stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. And what he said was, no, stop stretching it. The reason you're shifting that direction is because your other hip is tighter and it's pushing you that way. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, stretch that hip, not the other one. So 
Like, so he got me started on the right path and then meeting Jamie made a huge difference and, and uh, now we're, we're coming back. This is fascinating because I've been talking uh, quite recently about I've been doing a lot of osteopathy and I'm getting uh, you know, a guy to look at my biomechanics, my movement, what's tight, what's weak, and then at the same time getting in the gym with a strength coach and saying, right, what, what is too weak? What do we need to fix? And that has paid massive dividends. Like I don't get um, any mild sprains in my ankles playing rugby anymore. Um, I get a lot less SI joint pain. And you've basically done exactly the same thing, but you had almost a big trauma to make you think, shit, I need to do something about this. Yeah, I mean, most people, that's what it takes, right? Like, you, you know, it's not a problem until there's a problem. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, people would always ask me, oh, do you do any mobility work? And I'm like, nah, I just go and I start squatting. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I should have done some mobility work. You know what I mean? Like, maybe I, maybe I didn't do that the best way possible. But, uh, hey, you know, you live and you learn. And uh, you know what? It's only a failure or a mistake if you don't learn from it is the way I look at it. So your warm-up for your, let's say, squat session, has that changed? Are you doing something different? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, so the first thing I do um, when I get in the gym is I do a dynamic warm-up, and she calls it the world's greatest stretch. And um, basically it's going to warm up the hip, the spine, the low back, the – the hamstrings, the glutes, and uh, the upper body as well. And it's hard to describe, but um, uh, and then I, I do eight of those aside, and then I'll do uh, what are called knee wobbles, which is where I'll put a um, like a, a exercise band, uh, one of those perform right bands mm -hmm. around my knees, and I'll sit in the squat position, and I'll keep one knee uh, in position, and the other one I'll push it out. Mm -hmm. Right, so it'll be, and I'll do 15 on each side, each knee, and then I'll do um, uh, side lunges, side band walks, mm -hmm. you know, with the bands around my ankles, about 15 on each side, and I'll do that twice, and then I'll do uh, band kicks, so I'll kick slightly to the front, then to the side, then to the back on each leg uh, for three sets of 15. And then once all that's over, uh, oh, and I also I hang a band from the rack, and I just I breathe and I breathe into my basically I'm trying to breathe into my lat and contract my lat, and that's warming up my upper body. And um, after that, then I start my my squat warm up. So my warm up is usually about 20 minutes before I even get to squatting. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I start squatting, I usually squat my first probably three or four warm up sets with the the bands around my knees. Um, to really focus on me driving out and engaging my glutes. So, yeah, um, it's, it's quite a bit different now. <laughs> I agree. My warm-up is, is that kind of long as well. I wish I could squat perfectly as soon as I go into the gym, but I don't. Like My hips need a good loosen, back needs a yeah. loosen. It's just, it's just the reality. Um, okay, uh, fascinating. Well, I'm glad you're on the mend. I'm glad you're lifting heavy again because you know that's what you're passionate about. I suppose that actually raises the question – like, what's next for you physically? What's the next goal? Are you going to compete in the Worlds again? Is that what's on the horizon? Well, I mean, that's the goal. Um, the And so to do that, I can't – my qualification does not carry over, so i got to requalify. Oh. So I have to win nationals. Um, nationals this year is in October. I'm not going to be ready for that. Like, I could do it, but I wouldn't be at 100%. And yeah. so – my focus is 2017 nationals, so giving myself a good long time to get ready for that and uh, go all in for that. Nice. Well, good luck when it comes around. Um, okay, so I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that you know you've been piquing my interest with some reinvestment that I've done in kind of your education and how your thoughts have evolved. So, like you kind of opened a bit of a can of worms on metabolic damage and reverse <laughs> dieting a while ago. A lot has been said since then. Yeah. Different coaches have come on board with their opinions. You know, a bit of research has evolved. Um, how, how has your opinion changed? Almost give people an update, especially over here in the UK, of what's changed and how your thought process has evolved as a result of the conversations that you spurred. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had some, uh, especially with Eric Helms, um, had some conversations about things and and uh, it's made me think a little bit differently, and I think I'm a little bit more malleable now in terms of how I like to pull somebody after dieting, you know, uh, pull their calories back in, 
And whereas before it was always kind of, I wanted to go slower. Um, you know, now it just depends on the client. Like if somebody, I will tell people like, listen, if you want to stay lean, if your goal is to stay really, really lean and, and, but get your calories back up, you're going to have to do it slowly because you know, the, the faster you add calories in, the faster you're going to add body fat back. I mean, there's no magic. That's just how it happens. But if you want to feel normal faster, if you want to feel better faster, because you know, if you look at the case studies on like uh, drug free bodybuilders who have gotten ready for shows, all of them, literally every single one has been hypogonadal by the end. They are all low, like out of the the range of testosterone. So you're gonna feel like crap. Um, and so I'll tell people like, listen, if you wanna if you wanna reverse diet and you wanna go slow, you'll stay leaner, but you're gonna feel like crap for longer. So. If you're okay with that, then that's fine. I'm not judging that. Um, but if you want to feel better, you know, let's give you a better bump. And so I've kind of talked to Eric, you know, I found that it's interesting. I, I think that we don't have like a – people will say we have a maintenance level of calories. I don't think we have like a hard maintenance level of calories. I think what we have is a maintenance calorie range. Mm-hmm. I think there's a low end of calories we can maintain our weight on and like a high end of calories we can maintain our weight on. And, and that range may be different for different people. And um, so what I'll try to do is get people up to that quote unquote high end of their maintenance range. Um, and I'll, I'll, depending again on what their goals are, when's their next show, you know, what are their goals in the off season will depend on how aggressively we add calories back in. Um, but yeah, while, well, the scientist in me, I, I, I'll give you an example. I had a client who, we got him up to over 400 grams of carbohydrate and over 100 grams of fat intake a day, uh, and he was stage lean, still shredded. And this was somebody who had to get down to, he was actually leaner at that intake than he was when he was on stage. It was incredible. Um, and this is, we've documented this. But he still felt terrible, you know, because he's still really, really lean. And one day he came to me and he's like, Lane, would it be okay if I put on some body fat? I just feel terrible. And I said, and I kind of snapped out of it. I'm like, well, yeah, of course it's okay. I was just so focused on how cool it was that he was still really friggin' lean but eating a lot of food, <laughs> you know, that I forgot to think about the the actual um, the actual person, you know, which um, that's not, it's not like I'm like, oh, you know, no, you're going to stay shredded and I'm going to put up pictures of you and about how great you are. No, I was like, oh man, if you, yeah, if you want to feel better, of course, like let's, uh, we can, we can be more aggressive. You know what I mean? And we did that. And after a few months he felt way better, you know? So, um, that's probably what's changed the most is just my, I've tried to be more, more malleable and client specific, I guess is what I would say. So with, with, you just talked about this range of how we can stay lean on a, low and a high amount of calories is this is is this where the theory of adaptive metabolism have come in has come in that you know people do have these massive ranges and sometimes we might drop or add calories and literally nothing happens because some yeah. people adapt so much yeah i mean there's i've actually the guy i was talking about he's a very much an adaptive metabolism so when we were dieting him down his off season maintenance before we started prep was around like 700 grams of carbs a day and like two or 150, 200 grams of fat, like very fast metabolism. But by the end we had to get him down under 200 grams of carb intake per day. Um, because pretty much every week we'd have to adjust him because he would drop a little bit of weight and then stick and drop a little bit of weight and stick. And so, um, yeah, we have to adjust him constantly. And on the, on the plus side, um, on the plus side, when he when he's coming back up, when he's adding calories, usually he doesn't gain a lot of weight because his metabolism is adapting in the opposite direction, right? So I have seen these people who I had I had another girl, uh, she was an IPV bikini pro actually, and this is crazy. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Uh, we started her out. I just remember her carb intake. I don't remember her total calories, but her carbs were 120 grams a day, and her fat was like 40, right? And I got her up to 350 grams of carbs per day and 75 grams of fat. And she lost 10 pounds during that time, right? And so then she wanted to start prepping. And I'm like, this will be easy. She's losing weight while adding all these calories. Then we dropped her calories and we, we had to keep dropping them. She wasn't losing weight. We dropped them all the way down to 100 grams of carbs a day. And she literally didn't lose a pound. Wow. It was the craziest thing. Like, I, I mean, I know people say, well, you know, 
your non-exercise adaptive thermogenesis need like that adjusts when you're dieting all that. Yeah, but it doesn't explain like that big of a difference, you know. So, um, yeah, it was just really interesting. And obviously, we're probably talking about some outliers here, but it's just really interesting to see when you've got that kind of adaptive metabolism. How the other thing is, I think, is your body has kind of a, a, a dieting memory, for lack of a better term, in that if you've gone through like years of really harsh dieting. Um, I think you can start to get your calories back up to where you can maintain your body weight on a normal or like high intake. But when you go to diet again, um, you still have a hard time because your body just kind of flips the, uh, flips the survival switch and you just have a hard time getting it back, um, uh, back off. And so this is just all tenuous, um, uh, um, what I say conjecture on my part but it seems to fit with some of the data we have and, and what I've observed. So with, with that scenario, if you've got an, a, yo, a long-term yo-yo dieter or you've got someone that went from obese to really slim, what what's the solution then for that person long-term? Because they don't want to be on a really low level of calories. Right. Like, can they spend a just a long, dedicated amount of time to get up to what we would say is normal or optimal? So that's a really good question. And actually, there's actually is some research on that. So okay. if you lose weight and you can maintain it for at least two years, what we find is that that does become your new maintenance. Wow. So you, if you, but you have to maintain it. Okay. Or even if, it, let's say you have somebody who loses 200 pounds and they put 50 back on and, but they maintain that. Well, that's still better than what they were, Right. So a lot of people get so focused on what their lowest weight was. Well, maybe that's not something that's sustainable for you, you know, or maybe you have to, if you lose 200 and you put 50 back on, maybe you have to, you know, be in a, in a caloric maintenance or a surplus for a little while, and then you can take it back off and keep off more this time, right? So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at multiple dieting cycles in your, in your dieting history, all that sort of thing. And interestingly, I have this hypothesis and it'd be interesting to test. So just like we know that, oh, like we know leptin is very important for, for, for weight and weight maintenance and, and weight loss, we think. Well, what we know is that obese people have high levels of leptin, but they're insensitive to it, right? So even though they have high leptin, it doesn't keep them lean because they're not, they're, they're not sensitive to it. Well, I wonder if when you're losing all that weight, your leptin's going down, right? And they show these people that their leptin doesn't go back up. I am betting, if I was a betting man, I would say that they're becoming more leptin sensitive. So even though they have less leptin, they're more sensitive to those levels of leptin after they've dropped and maintained that weight for a long period of time. And that's what allows it to become their new maintenance. Does that make sense? Mm. It's kind of almost the same action as insulin in that when you become, when you lose weight, you do become more sensitive to it, whether you've manipulated yeah. carbohydrates or not. Absolutely, yeah, and that's that's actually one thing I, I, get, I try to talk about with the anti-carb zealots. Mm. I'm like, you, you realize if you calorie, like, yes, like, carbohydrate restriction works because it's calorie restriction. Uh, if you drop those calories, you become more insulin sensitive regardless, but that's, that part of that insulin sensitivity, interestingly, is for fat regain, is for, for you to gain fat back because we think about insulin sensitivity as a good thing, and it is for health, but um, if you're very insulin sensitive, that means you're also able to dispose more into fat cells as well. So it's a refilling effect. So um, as dieting down, you're becoming more insulin sensitive. That is so whenever you do it, are exposed to calories, you can dispose of them better. Well, one of the disposal areas is adipose tissue. So it, it is a good thing, but it's important to keep in mind that, like, um, you know, insulin sensitivity uh, goes both ways. Do you think the problem with this whole environment of kind of dieting, metabolism, and people's body weight, the biggest factor we face in people actually going through some kind of rehab or regaining a maintenance or regaining health is that in some people it is a case of patience and time. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge deal. I mean, everybody wants, you know, they watch The Biggest Loser and everybody loses 100 pounds in, you know, six months or whatever it is, and they think that that's a good idea, you know. And, and the fact of the matter is, think about, Whatever you're trying to lose, whether it's 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, or 400 pounds, um, you didn't put that on in, in, in 12 weeks. You know what I mean? So you didn't put the 20 pounds on in 12 weeks. You didn't put the 50 pounds on in six months. 
and you didn't put the 100 pounds on in, in one year, right? So why would you expect to take them off in that period of time? So yes, it has to be a very controlled patient. And actually, I was uh, taking an Uber the other day uh, with a guy, and it, it was funny, actually, small world. He, he had, he's like, yeah, I have a friend who works out. And he said his name. I'm like, yeah, tell him you gave Lane Norton an Uber. He'll know who he was talking about. Because I knew the guy from the message boards back in the day. Mm-hmm. It's funny. But he's like, yeah, sometimes you know, I get disheartened because I, I get, you know, I want to start going to the gym, but I just want it gone now. And I'm like, well, you can wish in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills up first. But, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to, like, it's just going to take time. That's just how the human body works. But it works the other way in that if we're talking about people that are interested in their physique, you know, when they get down low, this maintenance, there, there does have to be a patience thing with getting back up to maintenance. I know that your, your yeah. kind of reversal has been quicker, but it's, it's still patience. It's like, well, I, I don't want you to I, go out and have 10 pizzas. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to, to note that your maintenance, maintenance calories is a, is a, it's a sliding scale and it changes all the time, right? Because, and this is my main quibble with uh, people who say, well, reverse dieting is stupid. Just raise your calories up to maintenance. Okay. By definition, if you raise your calories to maintenance, you will not gain weight because it's maintenance. Mm-hmm. By definition. So what they're talking about is your predicted maintenance based on your lean body mass, based on your body fat, the, what you would calculate it to maintain your weight at. But we all know that after you've been dieting for a long time, like you can be on low calories. I mean, I've been down to 19 or 2,000 calories where I was maintaining my weight on 2,000 calories. For somebody my size, that's incredibly low uh, calories to maintain your weight on. Well, they would say, well, go up to 2,800 calories because that's your maintenance. Well, no, it's not my maintenance. <laughs> not at that point, mm-hmm. right? And if I went up to that, I would gain weight. So I'm not saying that it's not a good idea to, to jump your calories up as long as you understand there's some fat gain associated with that. What I'm saying is stop using the word maintenance because it's not an accurate description because you're only talking about theoretical maintenance. You're not talking about practical or actual maintenance. Interesting. Well, um, the last thing I wanted to touch on with the kind of the whole coaching aspect is the more I've listened to you over the last 10 years, the more you have talked or wanted to go into the psychology of the user. So it's almost like, you, you are an expert at understanding the maths and the science behind how the body is going to change, but you've really come to appreciate the person, why they're doing this, what you need to incorporate on this journey with them. So just maybe just talk me through kind of maybe your coaching process and maybe what other people need to consider when they're thinking about dieting, bodybuilding or physique-based uh, sports. Absolutely. So... The thing about coaching is people, you know, we talk about science and I love science. I love scientific studies, but no scientific study is going to tell you how to coach someone. That's, that is not how it works. Science is a big blunt instrument. Science usually tells us what not to do. Okay. So an example of that is, you know, we're relatively convinced that um, fasted cardio, for example, is not better than fed cardio for fat loss. Like the, the, the data is very clear on that. However, if I've got a client an individual, and I can say, well, you know what, you're better off eating beforehand because you'll have more energy and you're going to work harder and it's not, you know, so just always eat beforehand. Well, what if somebody, they work in an emergency room and the only time they can do cardio is in the morning and at 4 a.m. and they, uh, right when they roll out of bed and they feel terrible if they go exercise with food in their stomach, like should I make that person go and eat like a full breakfast when they don't have time and all that kind of no, I say, okay, well, do the fasted cardio then. You know, like it's fine. It's better than them not doing it. You know what I mean? Um, so say, and just even metabolic, not just schedules and whatnot. It's always like what you're doing, like everything's a trade-off, right? So you've got to look at that and understand for every gimme, there's a gotcha. So it's always about what are you exchanging for? So like with that last example, um, okay, well, if I told them, if I made them do the cardio like I thought was – optimal, um, then they probably just get discouraged not doing it at all, you know? So I have to look at, all right, is it better for them to get something in versus doing nothing? And then you say, okay, well, we can have our, I, and I think a lot of coaches out there live in this like fantasy world where everybody has eight hours a day to devote to training and prepping nutrition and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, no, most people have lives and they have other shit they've got to do. 
So let's focus on what's practical for people. If you get somebody who can live that way, great. They're easy. You know what I mean? Um, but then even more than that, like I'll tell people, like if you look at uh, scientific studies, so what is reported from scientific studies are means, right? And so actually it's funny. Um, like Law McDonald, his major criticism of me is the, the, adapt, the adaptation of metabolism of basal metabolic rate is only 15%. He always uses this term, 15%. Well, he's reporting an average, okay? If you look at averages and then you look at what the spread is, I mean, sometimes the spread is over double what the average is. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, you can find studies where they'll take people who have never weight trained before and or have very little experience and they'll weight train them for 12 weeks. And at the high end, you'll, you'll get somebody who was squatting, you know, like – 150 pounds when they started and at the end of 12 weeks they're squatting almost 400 pounds you know just an unbelievable responder and then you'll get somebody who weight trains for 12 weeks and doesn't get stronger like like there are those there are those data points and studies of people who did not get stronger mm -hmm. so like you're dealing with an enormous genetic spread right and also just how they respond to these things these treatments and so you know, with that big of a spread, do you really think that there isn't somebody whose metabolism could adapt much more than somebody else? And there's probably other people who don't adapt nearly as much, right? I mean, I've, I've anecdotally uh, worked with people who we have to make very few adjustments during their prep. They make, you know, we start them out in a diet and they make maybe like two or three adjustments over 16 to 20 weeks and they're done, you know? And then I've got people who have to adjust every single week. So I think when you don't, really understand scientific studies. So I always tell people like, so science is a big blood instrument, but we report in studies is means and averages, but you, you, Ben Coomer, you're not a mean or an average, you are an individual data point, right? And so what I'm going to do when I look at a, a client is when I look at what tr treatment I want, I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to start at the average, right? And I'm going to try and figure out maybe they're on this end of the average or this end of the average in terms of how I'm going to massage their protein, carb, fat intake, that sort of thing. But then I'm going to pay attention to what happens because they might be an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. And so if it's not working here, I think it could work better. I'm going to go this way a little bit or I'm going to go this way a little bit. You know, I'm talking theoretically. And see, okay, what, what, how far can we push it and where do they start to not respond well, Right. And so then we can kind of get our boundaries as to what works well for that individual person. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I kind of try to approach it. I use science and studies to give me kind of a rough guideline of what I want to do with somebody. But then you have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell somebody, like, I would love to see some of these guys who keep spouting this 15% number say, you know, well, no, you have to be losing weight because this is more than 15% adaptation and that just doesn't happen in the research. And it's like, well... Okay, you can say that and you can use that and carry it around like a golden saber or you can say, well, this is an individual and I need to accommodate them and say, okay, what is practically happening here? So at the end of the day, I'm a pragmatist. I care about what works, mm -hmm. right? And um, yeah, so that's how I try to approach everything. Absolutely, I will, I will start off more towards the centrist, more towards the, the means, but I'm not afraid to go outside those if I feel like somebody needs that. And that's the art of coaching. Like you can yes. read all the books that you want, but until you understand people and the complexity or the beauty of the human body, you will never really truly be successful as a coach. Well, I, I think you put it perfectly. Uh, science is a big blunt instrument. Coaching is an art form. Mm. And um, yeah, I think it's almost arrogant to assume that we've just figured out everything through the scientific studies we have. You know, there's so much stuff that's unexplored and that will, that if we waited for a scientific, you know, when I talk about reverse dieting, people are oh, well, there's no studies on this. I know. I know there's no studies on it. But I have something I feel I can help people now, okay? If I waited for a scientific study to get published on it, it may not be for another 10 years, yep. you know? So I can either say, well, I know I've observed this, but I'm just going to say, all those people were lying to me and those data points don't mean anything because it wasn't published in, a, in an actual scientific journal. Or I can say, you know, I've observed this. I think it can help some people. Let's try that. Yeah. So if somebody wants to argue with me about that and say I'm a sleazebag who's just trying to make stuff up, then 
That's fine, but it's funny because I'll say, you know, I've competed, I've coached over a thousand people, and I did a PhD in nutrition. I feel like if anybody can take a little bit of a leap, I should have that leeway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I should have a little bit of wiggle room to, to, to make a little bit of a leap, you know? Yeah, but it's, uh, it's apparently not like... Not. It's not like you're literally licking your finger and you're you're putting it in the air. It's still an educated, directed decision. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I've never tried to oversell it. I've never been like eh, reverse dieting is the secret to permanent weight loss. Mm. I've said, hey, you know, like this thing might be useful in certain circumstances, and here it is. Mm. You know, and if you don't want to use it, fine. I'm not mad at you, but you know, here you go. Love it. Um, Lane, I always love uh, talking to you. Your approach is always refreshing, direct and concise, which is awesome. Um, uh, for people that are listening, uh, Lane actually teaches a lot of uh, this at a more in-depth level on our academy, our online nutrition course, the Body Type Nutrition Academy. Uh, what do you teach, Lane? Is it protein metabolism, reverse dieting? Yeah, so I've been teaching contest prep, uh, the, the macronutrients, um, so basically like teaching people what protein, carbs, and fat do and then like kind of how to go up with figuring out, coming up with recommendations for clients and then uh, contest prep and, and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if people want to find out more about that, just Google the Body Type Nutrition Academy or uh, what is it? Text. You can text, mobile phone text the number 67076 and you'll find out more information. Um, Lane, the important thing is if people want to find out more about you or um, you know, if they want to explore your work, where should they find you? And also, is there anything new in your world that we should be paying attention to? Well, I'm about to have my second child, my daughter, so that's a big one. Uh, but uh, other than that, um, I'm, uh, I have a lot of stuff going on, but uh, I guess the, the best place to find stuff about, about me is uh, my website, biolane.com. Um, but the, the biggest thing that's going on is I have a supplement line now. It's called Carbon by Lane Norton, available exclusively on bodybuilding.com. And uh, one of the products is available in the UK. So uh, Carbon Recover, my branch chain drink, is available there. Um, but it's not just branch chains. There's other things in there that are great for recovery, reducing soreness, and, and uh, performing better. Um, but then uh, I've developed a website called Avatar Nutrition. I was telling you about this before we got on the air. And basically what Avatar Nutrition is, for $10 a month, you go to the website, and it's automated coaching. So for $10 a month, you will get – you'll plug in your information, and based on your body type, your metabolism – the information you input, it will give you custom protein, carb, and fat recommendations. And then as you check in every week, it will adjust those every week based on your goals, based on how you're progressing, and basically becomes an automated coach. So, you know, there's still a place for personal coaching, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But for the, for people out there who can't afford it, who are on a tight budget, this is a great option. And that's avatarnutrition.com. And uh, I cannot say enough about that. We have over 5,000 members and we have really high success ratings. Uh, we've lost, we've, we're tracking, we've had people lose tens of thousands of pounds of fat in total. It's pretty awesome. Mm. And um, yeah, we really think that that thing's going to be like the revolutionize the entire industry. And then um, my website, biolane.com, if you want more education stuff, uh, if you like, if you're on BTN and you love that stuff, you'll love our biolane.com site. Uh, we have a members area where I do a, a webinar. So for $15 a month, um, you get a webinar every month. You get uh, weekly Q&As with me. You get premium articles and videos and just a ton of information. And uh, I think it really offers a lot of value for, for people who don't want to go to a full-fledged course like maybe BTN but really want to expand their knowledge and aren't happy with what you know the average bro stuff you find out there. Mm -hmm. So I think that those, that's a good spot. And then, of course, on social media, you can find me anywhere as BioLane. Uh, the only exception is my Facebook page is facebook.com slash Lane Norton. Nice. Well, you're always sharing very good up-to-date information uh, and you're always willing to go out there and kind of pose thoughts. So I love that. So um, check Lane's uh, workout. Um, also, when this podcast goes live and you see it on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, engage with us. Uh, let us know what you think. Ask questions like me and Lane put ourselves out there as kind of thought-provoking, uh, educational characters. Um, and we're here to chat. So get involved. 
uh, spur conversation, ask Lane a question, uh, and kind of get involved in what we're trying to deliver. Um, Lane, thank you very much again for being on the show. I know everyone that's listening will be very appreciative. Thanks for having me, man. I always enjoy it. Uh, and for anyone that's listening, I will see you next Monday on our short, sharp Q&A show. That's goodbye from me. And then Lane would say goodbye, but he's not paying attention. Oh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> I Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was my cue. You got some hand signals or something. <laughs> Ciao, everyone. Hey, everyone. Vancouver Radio, episode number 220. Now, this will be a fast episode. I'm about to uh, whip out the door to uh, Rugby Frog at a Sundown Festival. 